Hi, and welcome to the first installment of AFIM's Critical Appraisal Tutorials, where we hope to teach you some techniques on how to critically look at and understand the medical literature and determine whether the evidence presented to you in a journal article is of good quality and practice changing. Determining the quality of evidence is even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic, where healthcare workers are bombarded with information and misinformation all the time. How should we interpret this information? What should we choose to believe? In this video, we will look at the levels and grading of evidence. We will also touch on whether the results of a journal article are clinically significant and applicable to your setting. So to begin, we must understand that not all evidence is created the same. Some evidence is more robust than others. Even if an article is published in a prestigious medical journal, it does not mean that it contains strong evidence to change your practice. And even if the evidence is strong, it may not be applicable to your setting or matter to your patients. You will need to evaluate the evidence and decide for yourself whether it is of good quality, whether it's relevant to your setting and free from bias. This is what we mean by critical appraisal of the literature. And it is a skill that will enable you to learn and keep learning for the rest of your life. Let's start by looking at what is called the evidence-based medicine or EBM pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid, expert opinion, is the most biased of the evidence. And at the top, systematic review, is the least biased. The higher you go up the pyramid, the more likely it is that the evidence represented is a true reflection of the population. However, as with everything, you need to be cautious when interpreting this. Even systematic reviews have their faults. Let's go through what is meant at each level of the pyramid and what the pros and cons of each level are. Let's get started at the bottom of the pyramid, expert opinion. Expert opinion means simply what it says, that an expert in a particular field thinks that in his or her experience, a particular piece of evidence is true. This is how medicine was practiced for many years before evidence-based medicine came to the fore. And while this is obviously subject to personal bias on the part of the expert, it still has its place in medicine. This is especially true in areas of research where good quality evidence is lacking or where ethical and practical reasons make performing a randomized control trial difficult. Such areas of research are things like resuscitation care, where the likelihood of an RCT is prohibited by the nature of the disorder. Ethical approval for trying novel drugs in such a life and death situation can be difficult and assigning randomization as well as gaining consent are all difficult to do. Another area is in novel diseases such as COVID-19, in which there is little research data as yet and medical professionals rely on others with more experience, such as the experience of clinicians in China, Italy and New York treating COVID-19. Although these experiences may provide great insight for other clinicians not yet facing the disease, we should keep in mind that this amounts to expert opinion and is not founded in robust evidence. Okay, now let's move on to case reports and case series. In case reports and case series, researchers simply describe what they find, either in one patient case, as in a case report, or in a series of patients in a case series. These studies give a detailed description of the history, physical exam, test results, clinical course, and disposition of one or few patients. But importantly, there is no control group. A control group is a group of participants in a study who do not have the disease or do not receive the intervention of the experiment. This is very important because it allows us to compare a group of similar patients in terms of age, gender and risk factors as a benchmark to the experimental group. And with such a small sample size and with no control group, it is difficult to tell in case reports or series whether disease or intervention will always act in a particular way 
or if it is just due to chance in this small group of participants. While the evidence generated in these studies may be weak, they do give us ideas on what to focus more research on. That is, they are hypothesis generating. They are usually the first studies to be published with a rare disease or disease that is new and allows clinicians to share their experience. We saw a multitude of these studies being published from Wuhan during the first part of the COVID-19 pandemic. Climbing higher up the EBM pyramid, we start to encounter research with study designs that include control or comparison groups in case control and cohort studies. In case control studies, there are two groups, one with the disease, the case, and one without, the control. These two groups are then compared by looking back in a retrospective study to see what they could have been exposed to. In a case control study, given the many things people are exposed to during their lives, it is difficult to say exactly what caused the disease in the first place. So we can determine what is associated with the disease, but not what actually caused it. The group with the disease can be more clearly thought of as the group that survived to be studied. In other words, we could be missing the people that died of the disease and that we did not study. This is called survival bias. However, these studies are very helpful to direct future research, and they can be to an extent generalized to the population at large and offer correlations between disease and risk factors. And always a big plus, these studies are not too expensive to do. In cohort studies, researchers initially start with a sample of the population that is disease free. They then divide the sample into two groups or cohorts in which one group has been exposed to the risk factor they are studying and one group that has not been exposed to this risk factor. They then look forward in time, which is called a prospective study, by following the two groups over time to see who eventually develops the disease and who does not. They can determine in this way whether the risk factor they are studying has an effect on how many people develop the disease. Again, because people are exposed to a wide variety of risk factors over their lives, it is difficult to say whether a particular risk factor is directly the cause of the disease or not. Also, because these studies usually take a long time, sometimes even decades, they can be very time consuming as well as expensive. Despite not showing exact causality, cohort studies do offer good evidence in terms of correlation, and we can derive that there are strong correlations with the disease, such as we do with lung cancer and smoking. These studies also offer good generalizability and help to target future research priorities. We have nearly reached the top of our evidence-based medicine pyramid. We will now look at non-randomized and randomized controlled trials together as they are quite similar. Let's talk about randomized controlled trials or RCTs as they are called first. RCTs also look at two groups but they allocate participants to these groups at random. RCTs then compare these two groups, just like in the cohort and case control studies, but whereas those studies simply observed participants, these types of trials are experimental. In other words, a new experimental treatment or intervention as it is called, is introduced to one group, the intervention group, while the control group is given no intervention or something that looks like the intervention but has no clinical effect, which we call a placebo. The participants in the trial do not know if they are getting the intervention of a placebo, and we call this blinding. Sometimes even the clinicians working with the participants also don't know which participants are getting the intervention and which are not. This is called double blinding. This double blinding eliminates many biases because if nobody knows but the researchers who is getting the intervention, then the clinicians don't favor the sicker patients by choosing to give them the intervention in the hopes that it may help them. Something called the placebo effect is also accounted for. 
This is when, because participants are anticipating an effect from an intervention, they display that effect, even if the drug or treatment has no actual effect and is neutral, a placebo. This is called the placebo effect. Because both groups receive something during the trial, either the intervention or placebo that looks just the same as the intervention, the placebo effect in both groups cancels out. RCTs provide very good evidence of whether an intervention works or not, provided that the sample size is big enough and that the study was well conducted. A non-randomized control trial is very similar to a randomized control trial, but the difference is in how patients are split into two groups. Whereas in RCTs, this is done by random methods, in non-RCTs, this is done by a predictable method, such as alternate patients arriving at a hospital or by the initial of their names. This may introduce a small bias into the study, but the quality of these studies when done well is also quite high, even though RCTs are preferred. RCTs undoubtedly have many strengths. But like everything in evidence-based medicine, they have their limitations. RCTs are subject to ethical limitations, as participants cannot ethically receive less than the standard of care for a particular disease or condition. For example, it would be unethical to withhold adrenaline in cardiac arrest as it is the standard of care, even though no actual RCTs exist to show its benefit. RCTs are also very expensive and may take a long period of time. One should also look out for a conflict of interest by the authors, as these are very expensive studies, they are often funded by large companies that may have a financial stake in the outcome and bias the results of the study in favor of the intervention that they own. Despite these limitations, RCTs remain the gold standard for determining cause and effect and for discovering if a particular treatment or intervention worked. They can also assess multiple interventions at the same time. Awesome job in reaching the top of the pyramid with me. Let's look at systematic reviews. A systematic review occurs when following strict guidelines, researchers take all the primary studies published on a particular subject and using a statistical method called meta-analysis, combine the data from all these studies into a synthesized result. As the name implies, the systematic review has a predetermined system as to how this is done. This system, or methodology as it is called, is published with the article so that this method can be scrutinized and is transparent. A systematic review usually produces very robust evidence, but even systematic reviews must be critically appraised, as systematic reviews with poor methods of synthesizing data, or systematic reviews that use poorly done studies as their primary data points, will not give robust evidence. Despite these limitations, a well-done systematic review is the least biased and most robust evidence available. These reviews present complex information from many studies in an easy to understand way for clinicians to appraise and review, and they are highly generalizable to the wider population. Great job in climbing the EBM pyramid with me. I want to add just a few points for you to think about. Research may be done in a different setting to your own. And the evidence, no matter how good, must be interpreted in the light of your own setting. For example, if good evidence points to using CT scans to diagnose COVID-19, but you don't have access to it for your patients, is that applicable to your practice? Probably not. So the study must be relevant to your setting to be useful to you. The second point is to always evaluate if a study is clinically significant and makes a difference to your patients. What if a study looked at whether patients prefer to have blue or gray nightgowns when they come to hospital? Now, I have chosen to make up a ridiculous example here, but I hope you get the idea. You need to ask yourself whether the question that the study answers is going to make a real difference to your patients. Is it centered around what patients really care about when they seek medical attention? Excellent work. We've come to the end of the tutorial. Let's wrap up. In this tutorial, we went over the following points. Not all evidence is of the same quality. There is a pyramid of evidence-based medicine. RCTs and systematic reviews are at the top of this pyramid. Even when evidence is good, it may not be relevant to your setting, or it may not matter to your patients. 
Thank you so much for watching this tutorial. Join me next time for more great AFM material on critically appraising the literature. These tutorials and other resources can be found at afm.africa forward slash resources. Thank you again.